Well, welcome back to Dispatch Radio. Um, I had the opportunity to meet my next guest a few weeks ago at the Unity in Action Conference here in the Tampa Bay area, and I wanted to have her on to talk about uh, medical marijuana and related issues in the state of Florida. On the phone right now is Jody James. She is the executive director for the Florida Cannabis Action Network. Hi, Jody. Are you there? Good morning. Thanks for letting me join you this morning. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad to have you. Um, clearly, uh, legalization of medical marijuana and also the decriminalization of marijuana is seeing a public reception like I've never seen before. You know, there's about 20 states with medical marijuana. Um, then, of course, there's Washington and Colorado that have gone full-fledged. Right. Uh, so the, the wind is behind your back. But I wanted, you know, to you're, you're concentrating on Florida, and I wanted to ask you a few things. You know, how do you convince people that medical marijuana is a good thing? And I wanted to start with uh, um, you put out a pamphlet that I picked up called Florida Veterans for Cannabis. And um, I understand that, you know, people should have the right adult individuals to um, ingest or put in their bodies whatever they choose. That's that's their That should be their right. But to the skeptics out there, uh, they may just be thinking this is a ploy for the potheads. So I, I want to look at some of the medical issues first. And you have about almost a dozen different uh, conditions on here. And... Uh, like, I'd like you to tell me some of the medical benefits. Uh, for someone that has multiple sclerosis, what does marijuana do for them? Wow. You picked an easy one. I thought you were going to ask me the hard question. It's coming. you got a tough <laughs> audience. Uh, particularly when it comes to um, this is really not a tough sell anymore. When I first started doing this 16 years ago, maybe. But over the last 15 years since the passage of Proposition 215 in California, and with the Internet, we are just seeing an incredible influx of people who are getting diagnosed with something. They're going to the Internet, and they're finding cannabis. They're listening to real-life stories. And let's talk about MS for a minute. If you have MS, you're going to deal with fatigue. You're going to deal with depression. You're going to deal with a lot of chronic pain, and you're going to deal with a lot of spasticity. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we've always joked about is cannabis and getting you high. So if depression is something that you're dealing with, a little bit of euphoria is probably not a bad thing. But I want to move past that because everybody knows about that. What people don't know, or what some people don't know, is that cannabis is excellent for that muscle spasticity that these folks are experiencing with MS. You might be talking about someone whose muscles are so spastic that they're drawn up. You've probably seen that before. A couple puffs off of a marijuana cigarette, and you'll begin to watch this person physically and visibly relax. We're talking about their whole body, and not just, whoa, dude, I'm feeling so stoned. Mm -hmm. We're talking about relax relaxing at the muscular level. In 2001, the federal government applied for a patent on cannabis medicine. So they patented, uh, received the patent in 2003, cannabinoids, um, which is an active ingredient in cannabis. They call them cannabinoids. That's what the different chemicals are, are different types of cannabinoids. And they patented cannabinoids for an antioxidant, an anti-inflammatory, and a neuroprotectant. Now, when you think about antioxidant, everybody's looking for an antioxidant. Purple juice, red juice, grape berries, you know, it's always something for your antioxidant. Particularly in a place like, um, you know, a, a time like we live in where you're being constantly bombarded with chemicals, antioxidants are a great thing. But that anti-inflammatory is huge for people who have things like fibromyalgia, which is an inflammation disorder, and MS. Again, you're going to be talking about someone who's got a little bit of swelling and, and stuff happening inside the joints with MS. The neuroprotectin is huge. That's where we're really going to start to see some space-age breakthroughs. How many people do you know with Alzheimer's? Right. What about the increasing rate of Parkinson's? 
MS also needs this neuroprotectant. And my president, Kathy Jordan, who is the president of the Florida Cannabis Action Network, is a woman living with Lou Gehrig's disease. And she will tell you she found a strain of cannabis that made her disease stop. Now, I don't have Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't know what that means. What I do know is that doctors gave her three to five years to live. She came to Florida. She tried a strain of cannabis here in Florida that was called Mayaka Gold, grown in the Mayaka River area by some good old boys. And God bless them. She's been surviving 27 years with Lou Gehrig's disease. Fantastic. Uh, um, I like, to, if you don't mind, Jody, I like to open up the phone lines to see if anybody has a question for you. Um, I you can, love it. Okay, you can some you can contact. Are listening? Absolutely, uh, you can contact us locally at seven two seven four four one three thousand or toll free one eight six six eight two six thirteen forty. If you want to talk to Jody James. Um, Actually, uh, my engineer, uh, Bill, would like to ask you a question, Jody. Hey, Jody. Hi, hey, Jody. Uh, what does uh, medical marijuana, does it, uh, what's its effects on PTSD and anxiety? Does it, does it help it? Well, um, thanks. Well, you guys have filled me great questions. I feel like we could make, take this show on the road. There we go. <laughs> yeah, we're very, we're, I hate to say excited. But I am kind of excited. We have been looking at this veterans project that we were mentioned earlier for a little over a year. And a common disorder that folks are coming back with in our military is post-traumatic stress. So I feel like I'm kind of right on top of this one this week. But um, the, the area of post-traumatic stress is huge. We have te- literally tens of thousands of veterans being treated at the Bay Pines facility for post-traumatic stress, literally tens of thousands. If you are in a state like Florida that doesn't recognize medical access to cannabis, then you're talking about getting into a traditional course of psychotropics. When we started looking at the Veterans Project a year ago, a veteran was committing suicide one every 80 minutes. Here we are, less than a year later, and today a veteran is committing suicide one every 62 minutes. Now, that round of psychotropics that you're going to be put on if you are in a state like Florida, two-thirds of the medications that they use for post-traumatic stress, one of the side effects is suicidal tendencies. So now you're talking about giving men who are and women who have experienced incredible traumas the opportunity to have a drug that will put suicide in their thoughts or look at using cannabis if we're in a cannabis-friendly state. I think this is fascinating. Um, We're talking about, and we actually have got a little blurb that talks about post-traumatic stress. Cannabis and post-traumatic stress, you're going to be able to talk about someone who's going to be able to... um, learn breathing techniques, it's going to help in their therapies. Post-traumatic stress, cannabis is not a cure-all for post-traumatic stress, but it is something that's going to allow them to reduce their anxiety. It's going to allow them to separate themselves from the situation. It's going to allow them to um, benefit greatly in other means of therapy, and it's not just going to medicate it like we're doing in the traditional forms. But I think this is interesting. Everybody wants us to study, get more studies on cannabis. Now, if you ask a lawmaker, they'll say, well, there's no studies. If you ask someone like me, I'll tell you there's 6,500 plus studies, and many of them are double blind. But I love this. I just learned this recently. There's an organization that was actually once based out of Sarasota called the Multiple Disciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. It is what it says that it is. (laughs) Researchers from around the world who study various psychedelic drugs, uh, MDMA, LSD, and cannabis are among the drugs that they study. They recently were able to get permission from the federal government to do PTSD studies with MDMA, commonly known as ecstasy. They have received permission and have begun studies with veterans post-traumatic, diagnosed with post-traumatic stress using LSD, But would you believe the government is blocking them the second time from getting pharmaceutical-grade cannabis to use in a study with veterans in post-traumatic stress? So they will give them MDMA, 
and they will give them LSD, but they're just not sure about that pot. Wow, amazing. <laughs> you know, one of the things that really, re- really triggered my attention when I met you was you were talking about a, uh, the National Cancer Institute um, where they were talking about uh, the anti-tumor effects of uh, uh, cannabis. And I got, I got some of their information right in front of me, and it says, uh, you know, one study of mice and rats suggested that cannabinoids may have a protective effect against the development of certain types of tumors. Uh, there was a two-year study. Uh, these rodents were force-fed THC, and uh, they saw a decreased incidence of uh, liver tumors and liver cancer and stuff like that. Um, however, you know, I, I, I pretty much keep up on the news pretty well. I hardly heard that covered anywhere. You know where I found this? A blog called the Weed Blog. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Well, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I would, I would think this is this is kind of like big medical news, but uh, I couldn't find it anywhere else but some blogs. Um, well, go ahead. <laughs> no, please, you. No, I was going to say. I mean, I was going to ask you any thoughts on that. I mean, is 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 mainstream media trying to suppress this kind of information? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, cancer is certainly big business in this country, but I, I think that my thoughts overall bring us back to the very beginning when you introduced me to someone who's working on medical access to marijuana. And that's only half true. I believe in cannabis as part of a wellness routine. And you didn't say this study that they gave mice THC and it killed their tumors. You said it prevented them. And so now we're not talking about cannabis as a medicine for someone who's sick, but we may very well be looking at cannabis as part of a regular diet routine to keep people healthier. What we have learned, and we is really a researcher in Israel, (laughs) so don't let me put too much pride into this. A researcher in Israel by the name of Dr. Meshulam has been studying cannabis and cannabis medicine since the 1960s. He's probably the godfather of cannabis medicine. He recognized a chemical in the brain called ananamine, and ananamine in Hebrew has to do with joy. It's the joy molecule. It's something that happens in your brain. And if your ananamines are good, and after the discovery of the ananamines, he realized that we actually have an endocannabinoid system. So just like you have a lymphatic system, just like you have a circulatory system, you have an endocannabinoid system. Your endocannabinoid system, when it is firing properly and all is full of endocannabinoids, you are healthy, you are well, and you are balanced. When your endocannabinoid system is damaged, when it's thrown out of whack for whatever reason, then you're going to start to have disease in the body. It might manifest itself through Lou Gehrig's disease. It might manifest itself as cancer. But all in all, it is being out of balance in this endocannabinoid system. Again, this is not my research. This is coming out of Israel. Are the media, mainstream media trying to suppress this kind of stuff? I don't know. Maybe, because investors are certainly juggling right now to figure out how they're going to position themselves in the market. I have often said that the reason that cannabis slash hemp slash marijuana is illegal probably has as much to do with the fact that the hemp industry didn't have great lobbyists. Back in the day, 1930s, 1940s, when we were coming um, less of a, uh, oh, I know I'm going to get my language right. You know, this is the time, the 30s, um, 20s and 30s through the 30s, when we sort of started to sell America to corporations, personhood, Federal Reserve, and when all of that was happening, um, it was the era of big business, the start of huge lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and cannabis hemp didn't have one. The business interests at the time believed that um, there was more money to be made in other businesses and by suppressing one industry that they could profit in another. That's standard business features. Are we still seeing that today? Maybe. This is definitely going to be big business. In nine states with legal dispensaries, there is an estimate out there that it will be a $9 billion annual industry. So we're talking a billion dollars per state. Okay, great. Uh, We have a call. Um, Brandon's on the line. Do you have a question for Jody James? 
Yeah, Jody, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be in the studio this morning. I uh, definitely wanted to ask you, though, to kind of address your um, your group's movement of trying to address sort of the PR problem with this, because obviously, um, you know, you've got a lot of parents that are listening and are concerned about, you know, how are we going to, um, h- how is it working in places like California? How do we keep the movement to treat the appropriate people with medical needs but keep it out of the hands of the folks that, you know, don't qualify? And send the mixed messages to our children. And, um, you know, you talked about a wellness program. So, unfortunately, especially to the critics who are looking at the negative first, that sounds an awful lot like it's just a, it's not necessarily a gateway drug, but a gateway program. It's like one step to open the doors to make it that much easier for accessibility. So how do you respond to that criticism? Well, first I would say I don't know how marijuana gets to be a whole lot easier to get. Um, we find that 12th graders find it easier to get access to cannabis than they do uh, alcohol. That's the kind of things that they report in their studies. We know that somewhere near a million people are going to use cannabis in the state of Florida this month. Actually, I think it's more like a million six is the last thing I saw. <clears throat> Anybody who wants it is using it right now. When we start to regulate and control cannabis, we're going to do things like reduce distribution points. So if you're really worried about your young person getting access to cannabis, we need to put it into a regulated market, not leave it in the hands of people who will sell it to anyone. You know, that's kind of the the black market talking. Um, When you talk about we don't want to legalize it, we don't want to make it available for adults, I have raised two children now, and they're not entirely raised. I'm not sure they're ever entirely raised. The oldest is 19 and the youngest is 15. And I tell people that I have practiced what we call harm reduction by teaching my kids the truth about drugs. My 19-year-old doesn't live at home anymore, and he still tells me he has never tried alcohol, well, beyond a jello shot, but that was an accident. Um, (laughs) But, you know, he's not into alcohol and partying. He's into physical fitness and entrepreneurialism. My youngest is 15. He's not into drugs and alcohol. He's in the straight A's, playing the cello and exceeding in marching band. I have never, ever hid true information about drugs from my kids. If we really want to change the paradigm with drugs and kids, we need to change in our own home. And it starts with when your kid comes home and says, Mom, I've got a headache, you say, wow, have you had enough water to drink today? Do you want to lay down for a while? Can I get you a cold rag? Or you say, hey, let me give you some pills. If your answer to your kids is fix it with drugs, then I assure you when they have a problem, they will fix it with drugs. And nothing that we are doing with marijuana is going to have any effect on that. Right now, kids are abusing Ritalin. Kids are being given Ritalin in massive amounts. And they're abusing it, and it's setting them up for a lifetime of drug abuse. When my oldest, who's 19, they, when they first started talking about Ritalin, because he's definitely high drunk, I assure you, my result was take red food dye out of our diet and assure that he didn't have any sugar before he went to school. It wasn't putting him on drugs. So right now I say if we regulate and we control cannabis, which is removing it from, once we remove cannabis from Schedule 1, all discussions are about regulation and control. That's when we get to determine who gets to use cannabis, where it gets to be distributed from, and between now and then we're putting fingers in a, in a dike and the holes just keep on coming. Okay, great. Thanks for that call, Brandon. Um, we have a call from Anna Maria Island, Virginia. You got a, a question or comment for uh, Jody James? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. I am a pain patient, and I have been for uh, about 10 years. I've had multiple spinal fusions, and I have four autoimmune diseases, including peripheral neuropathy. I am not allowed to try miracle marijuana because it's illegal in this state. However, I was ac- I have access to all these other painkillers, including morphine. I'm asking our country, which is worse for you, all these pills or to try a substance that may or may not work? 
I am 62 years old. I'm not stupid. I don't plan to do anything stupid. But the way the law is right now is extremely wrong. It should be legalized, taxed, get us out of national debt, let the people that have pain try this for themselves. That is my comment, and I really hope that the government is listening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Virginia. Jody? The government's made up of people just like you and I. And if we're listening and we're talking about it, I heard over the weekend, Reverend, last weekend I was in Denver for an international drug policy conference that was absolutely phenomenal. Black preacher out of Nashville was speaking at the opening plenary, um, a Reverend Saunders. And he is kind of a hero of mine. His church recognized that um, the problem in their community was um, heroin and that the way that they could address the heroin um, problem in their community was to do needle exchange. So his congregation um, made the decision to break the law and give drug addicts clean needles in order to reduce the harm that was um associated with heroin use and began to get them into the church's ministry. But what, what Reverend Saunders was, said was, um, <clears throat> with a strong voice, even bad people will do the right thing. So I don't believe that everyone we have right now is that is elected are doing bad things or are bad people. But certainly the elected officials need to hear a strong united voice on this and i'm glad to hear from someone from virginia saying or from um i'm sorry it was virginia right her name is virginia from anna maria island from virginia it, it's wonderful to hear someone like virginia speaking with a strong voice saying you know what i don't know if this is going to work but all of my research points to the fact that it might and if it might and this is a gentler alternative for me, then I should be allowed to try that. Exactly. Um, we're going to keep working for you, Miss Virginia. I assure you, day in and day night, day in and day out, we are working for you. Well, I just hope I'm not dead before it passes. <laughs> uh, bless yeah. your heart. Yeah. Thank you for letting me speak. Thanks, now, Virginia. And the, the Republican-controlled legislature here in Florida is certainly getting the message. They understand that what we're doing with um, pharmaceutical drugs and narcotics just can't continue. Again, I've been looking at the VA system, and the VAM is the national system. It's actually the largest national hospital system in the country, servicing over 8 million veterans every year. And they're prescribing... 280% more opiates than they were 10 years ago. Yeah, the opiates are dangerous. They really are. They really are. Mm -hmm. And when you get to a certain point, they put you on methadone because that's the strongest painkiller they've got at this point. I was on um, morphine for 10 years. Wow. And yeah, the distraction I got off that about is. two years ago. I didn't want to take it anymore. I was sick of living my life around okay. a pill. And, baby, I'm telling you, the research is out there. If you add a little bit of cannabis to your current routine, you can reduce the amount of opiates that you need to use to manage your pain. That is what it's I've been all hearing. Out there. It's that all is what out I've there. been hearing. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, they used to talk about, and I think Brandon mentioned too, you know, this is a gateway drug. Well, we're actually in no. the process of putting together a brochure calling it an exit drug. Uh, it's still a gateway, right? Exit in, exit out. Um, you can go both ways. But for cannabis, it really helps people who have used these pharmaceutical drugs, whether they're talking about addiction or just the way it makes your life. Because if you're using heavy narcotics, getting out of bed, and getting to the shower is a major accomplishment Correct. that your family needs to congratulate you on every day, Miss Virginia. Yeah, I'm doing okay. I really am, and I'm on very, very low doses, but I still think it should be up to the individual to try something that may or may not help. It should be up to the individual. And this is a great time for me to plug my website, www.f is in Frank, L is in Love, C is in Charlie, A is in Apple, and is in Nancy. That's FLCAN because together we can. FLCAN.org. You can go in there and you can find some pre written letters. You can click here to send a letter to your representative. If you haven't already talked to your Florida House and Senate member, make sure that you do. I have. 
Good. And when it comes time to write you write a donation check, because here comes the parties, it's almost that time, put a little note at the bottom. I am opposed to marijuana prohibition. I need medical marijuana. You should whatever your little note should be, because like it or not, politics is run by checks. And a lot of sick people Unfortunately, by the time you get to the point where you've been sick for a dozen years, you don't have resources. And I think that's part of the biggest battle the Florida Cannabis Action Network faces and probably one of the reasons why Florida is lucky that a gentleman like John Morgan has gotten involved in the discussion. Yes, I've been in touch with him, too. I have. I'm trying to go all the legal way, all the way through our House and Senate. I'm trying to do the right thing, but there's not enough of us. Well, we can um, believe that with 73% of the population in Florida saying yes to medical marijuana, and nationally, the numbers are just that good. And I know that the Global Dispatch is not just about Florida. I'm trying to make it global. Well, I hope it works for the majority of us. Uh, someday, something has to give in this situation. It'll be soon. I, I, we will definitely have marijuana for available for our sick patients between now and 2016 i have no doubt about that all right jody i'm I'm getting close to the end of the show i just want i just uh in about 60 seconds um any predictions you know on uh what's going to happen in florida i know you're battling with pam bondi and and all that um the 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 people win and the plant prevails the people win and the plant prevails well fantastic um I've been talking to uh, Jody James. She's the executive director for Florida Can. And I appreciate you coming on, Jody. There were so many more questions. I'll have to have you on again. Always my pleasure. Uh, Thanks for giving us this time this morning. You bet. Please Take send care. people to our website and let them know about our veterans tour. We're doing great things in the state of Florida and around the country, and we can't do it alone. That's www.flcan.org. Have a nice